Let me just, <clears throat> excuse me, say at the outset that as Paul is, is seeking to, to prove his point here, he's proving it to us as, as well as to them. Why should we listen to what he has to say? Well, we know the answer to that already, but uh, hopefully this will reinforce it uh, in our own hearts and, and minds. So let me begin by reading the text that we're going to be looking at. Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24. <clears throat> would you please give careful attention to this? This is God's word. Paul writes, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which, I pre which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then, after, then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become, to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. What a, what a radical change. But again, that's um, one of the evidences Paul's going to point to. But the first one has to do with the fact that when Christ converted him, he revealed the truth to him, and Paul didn't even have contact with the apostles for three years. He was already preaching the truth. So we're going to learn more about that as we, as we go through chapter 2 as well, but we, we're only going to have time to focus on what he says here in chapter 1. Now last week, remember, we looked at Paul's introduction to the letter. After he first identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And those to whom he wrote, remember in this case the churches of Galatia. Not just one church, but there were many that were being affected by the problem that Paul's addressing here. Which is the gospel of works that the Judaizers have, have brought. Um, and after giving his customary Trinitarian greeting, uh, you know, which is a petition that, that God might bless them with this peace, that they might experience um, just the, the assurance of knowing their sins are forgiven, that they're clothed with Christ's righteousness, and they're accepted and loved in him. You know, the comfort that comes from the Father and the Son, but which is worked in their hearts by the Spirit. I just wanted to repeat that because when Paul says, grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, he really is giving a Trinitarian uh, greeting um, so all three persons are involved in this. So after this, he passed over, remember, his customary thanksgiving because there really wasn't much to be thankful for in their current situation because of the seriousness and the urgency with which he is writing. And he went on immediately to, uh, to address that issue. Now the issue is he could hardly believe that they had so quickly abandoned the gospel of God's free grace in Christ, the source of their blessings, the source of their peace for the gospel that these Judaizers brought, a gospel of works. Now let me just remind you what the Judaizers believed. They believed that we needed Jesus. Okay? You have to trust in him. He is the Messiah to be saved. But Jesus is not enough by himself. You still needed to be circumcised. And keep the Mosaic tradition. So what they were doing essentially was this. They were adding faith in Christ to the Mosaic covenant. Rather than seeing Jesus as the one who fulfills that covenant, uh, 
and replaces it with the new covenant that no longer has that burdensome system of, of you know, washings, cleansings, and sacrificings, and so forth, because Christ has fulfilled all that. So they held this position, combining Judaism with Christianity, because they did not want to be persecuted by their fellow countrymen. And, you know, this might be something we, we don't often hear and perhaps weren't aware of, but the Jews, the unconverted Jews, they objected more to the Gentiles being accepted into God's covenant without receiving the covenant sign of circumcision. They, re, they reacted against that more strongly than to the preaching of Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't object to that as much as they did to the Gentiles being received without circumcision. So that's the reason why the Judaizers were requiring this, because if they did, then they'd be at peace with most of their countrymen, and they thought with the church. Well, again, Paul is saying this gospel is not good news. It's a distortion of the only truth that could save them. And to believe the Judaizers' gospel would be, as Paul says, to perish forever. Now, we need to make sure we understand that up front. That's the reason why Paul pronounces the, the uh, imprecation that he does on them. But we will read later in this letter, in chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to everyone who receives, or every man who receives circumcision, that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. And what, he, what he's telling us here again is that the, you know, to be justified by God's grace by a free gift means that you cannot add any of what you do into the mix because grace, the free gift of God, and works are mutually exclusive. It cannot be both. It has to be one or the other. And it's clearly not by works. It's clearly by God's grace. They are mixing works, okay? Because the Judaizers are saying you need to be circumcised and observe the traditions of Moses as well as believe in Jesus Christ to be saved, to be justified. And that's important to see because we also know in the New Testament that Timothy was circumcised and Paul kept the Mosaic traditions, you know, and so we say, is that a contradiction? No, because they were doing that so as not to create an offense for the gospel. They weren't doing that in order to justify themselves before God. So it depends on where you put those things. You know, if you're going to say faith plus circumcision and keeping the Mosaic traditions equals justification, that is the destruction of the gospel. But if you say faith equals justification plus good works as a result of my justification and some of those works becoming all things to all men so that I may bring Christ to them. That's the gospel of God's free grace. So I hope you see the difference between those two things because that's what this epistle is really all about. Now, remember, to show how serious this was, Paul pronounced the curse on those who taught it. And I don't think I said this last week, but we do need to recognize that Paul says it twice and when something is repeated in scriptures, such as amen, amen, when Jesus says, you know, surely, surely, or certainly, certainly, is he's emphasizing something. Or if he pronounces a woe and he pronounces seven or eight of them, you know, he's emphasizing something. Well, here Paul emphasized the curse upon the Judaizers for bringing this gospel. He says, but even, or anybody who would, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what... Um, we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel uh, contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Now that applies to any teaching, any gospel that anyone would bring today that includes works. For justification. As we saw last week, there, there are many of them. Does God take this seriously? Yes, he does, because this is robbing him of his glory. Plus, you can't be saved by a false message. All right. Now, in this next section, as we've already said, Paul begins to expand on what he introduced earlier, 
his apostolic calling, that he wasn't, quote, sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. As I mentioned last week, he's establishing his credentials. Why the Galatian Gentiles? Why we should listen to him rather than to the Judaizers, rather than to those who would bring to us a gospel of grace and works, which again is impossible. Now we've seen first that they should listen because he wasn't sent merely by the church. He wasn't an apostle of the church merely, although to be an apostle of the church would be a good thing. It's important. But he was sent by Jesus Christ and by God the Father. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, secondly, he's saying we should listen to him. Um, they should listen to him because of the divine origin of his message. That Jesus Christ gave him this message. And really, it is the message of the entire Old Testament. Now, that's what Paul goes on to tell them in verses 11 and 12. And I'll read it one more time. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, commentators believe from the content of this letter that the Judaizers appear to be claiming that Paul received his instruction from the apostles in Jerusalem. They were the recognized authority at that time. That's the reason for the Jerusalem you know, Council, at least one of the reasons, which um, I believe that the writing of the book of Galatians is likely already taken place, and, and we'll see that next time. But they were the recognized authority. Paul received this, this instruction. But they were claiming that Paul had rebelled against the instruction he received from the apostles and was teaching now a false, a false gospel while they were teaching the true gospel. Well, Paul goes on to counter that argument. He says, on the contrary, he did not learn his gospel from them. He learned it from Christ. Now, again, he's referring to that event that we read about earlier in Acts chapter 9, how while he was on his way to Damascus to imprison the, any that he might find belonging to the way, Jesus appeared to him in glory and changed the whole direction of his life. Now, I mentioned earlier that Luke does not record that Jesus taught Paul anything at that time, except what is, who he was, you know? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Go into the city, and it'll be told you there what you're supposed to do. Well, um, that's all we hear Jesus telling him. And we don't see or hear Ananias teaching him anything more when Paul went into the city and was healed and baptized by him. But what's the first thing we see the Apostle Paul doing after he you know, eats and is strengthened? Immediately, he begins to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues of Damascus as the Son of God. Paul had already received his gospel okay, by this time. Now, what are we to make of this? So I think this, when Paul saw the risen and glorified Christ, the Spirit immediately changed his heart. Now, Paul was already very well versed in the scriptures. He knew them quite well as a, as a Pharisee. And as we know from his own explanation of his life, he was extremely zealous for the scriptures. Now, during these next three days, while he was still blind and fasting, I think we need to assume that the Spirit of God showed him. I think he probably realized when Jesus appeared to him on the road, but I think showed him more fully how Jesus fulfills everything that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, was pointing to. It's kind of like Luther, you know, in his, his conversion, he had his aha experience where he, he knew the scriptures. He had large portions of the Old Testament memorized and of the New Testament, and he didn't understand any of them because he was lacking the key. And then when the Lord revealed the key to him, suddenly the, the door opens and this wealth of information begins to flood into his mind. Suddenly all the scriptures make sense. And I think the same thing happened here with the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul goes on to tell us that after that experience, he would not have contact with the Jerusalem church for another three years. After Christ called him to be his apostle to the Gentiles, he said, I did not speak to anyone about it, or did I seek out the apostles, 
but he went away to Arabia. Now, you know, that sounds like Paul took a trip somewhere and spent a lot of time maybe, and maybe we're thinking, I think I've heard some, I've read that some believe this, that he went away to this far distant land to spend time with Jesus and reading the scriptures and, and really formulating what, you know, what it all means. But that's not really what he's talking about here. Damascus, which is where he was, okay, when he was preaching Christ, is in Syria. And if you think about how that, the map of Palestine goes, I don't have one to show you this morning, but you know that there's Judea and there's Galilee and Samaria is in between. But then there's Syria above Galilee. And that's where Damascus is. And it's bordered by the um, Mediterranean Sea, okay? So where is Arabia? Well, Arabia we think of as like further south. You know, this is where, uh, you know, Mount Sinai and all these places are. Well, Arabia at that time extended all the way north to where it was parallel to Syria and Damascus. So it was a very short trip to just go over to, to Arabia. And I think that's what he's referring to here. Um, Arabia at this time was ruled by King Aretas, and he was one who also had authority over Damascus. Paul was simply going to the cities that were in Syria and Arabia, and he was preaching the gospel. Uh, so maybe he spent some time in Arabia, maybe he kept going back and forth between those, those two places, but he continued to preach to the Gentiles, and then he returned to Damascus. Luke tells us that he was there for many days. And Paul tells us in our passage that those many days were actually three years in which he was preaching the gospel in that area. Now, by this time, the Jews had had enough, <laughs> and they wanted to kill him. And that's when Paul escapes from them uh, through that basket in, in the wall. And that's why I mentioned King Eretus earlier, because we read in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 32-33, in Damascus, the ethnarch under Eretus, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. I think what we usually think of when we read the book of Acts, Paul's converted, he preaches for maybe a few weeks, if even that long, in Damascus, and then he has to escape in the basket because they want to kill him. But he was there for three years, okay? So we need to understand three years bouncing between Damascus, Syria, and Arabia, uh, preaching the gospel in that area. Now, Paul says it was after this that he first came to Jerusalem since the time of his conversion. Verses 18 and 19 of our text. Then, after, oh, then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any or, or any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now Luke tells us that at this particular visit to Jerusalem, uh, the, the disciples were, were a little bit suspicious of Paul. You know, still, after three years, uh, they thought, is this just a big you know, ruse to maybe get into our fellowship and then to expose all of us and arrest us? And they weren't willing to receive him until Barnabas reaches out to him and takes hold of him and brings him in and they all receive him and they accept the fact that yes he is changed now on this occasion Paul tells us he spent a few days getting to know Cephas and Cephas as you know is simply the Aramaic name of Peter and he also saw James the Lord's brother and this is the James that we'll later see as the head of the Jerusalem Council the same James who writes the uh, the epistle James um, in the New Testament. But Paul's point here is that this is the first contact that he had had for three years since he was converted and began his ministry. And on this occasion, he only met Peter briefly just to get to know him and James and didn't see any of the other apostles. His point being, he wasn't distorting a gospel that he had received from the apostles. He was preaching a gospel that Jesus had entrusted to him for the Gentiles, which will be proven further at the Jerusalem Council. Okay, so that's Paul's testimony. Okay, this is how I received it. But Paul is only testifying himself. He has no other witnesses right now uh, 
to corroborate the evidence. So what does he do next? He swears an oath before God that what he is saying is true. He says in verse 20, Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Okay, this is an oath that Paul is taking. Now remember what the third commandment is all about? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. We often think that what that means is that you should never use God's name as a swear word, and certainly you should not do that, okay? But what that commandment is really addressing is vows, taking of vows and oaths. And that's what Paul is doing here, and he realizes what a serious sin it would be to call upon the name of the Lord to bear witness to what he is saying to be the truth, even as it would be as we make promises to God, to say, I promise for God I'm going to do this and then not do it. When we call upon God's name, the third commandment says, do not do that in an empty way. Make sure you pay what you vow. Make sure what you swear to, the, you know, to is the truth is the actual truth. Paul wanted them to know that he was in earnest. Okay, that's the reason why he takes this oath. But now the question comes, what about after the first visit to Jerusalem? Could Paul have been discipled after that? Well, he goes on to tell, tell us what his experience was after that. He writes in verses 21 through 24, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. By the way, Syria is where Damascus is. After he went to Jerusalem, he went back up. Okay, went back up to Syria. And then he went even further to Cilicia. We'll see why in just a moment. But he says, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, which means he just spent that brief period of time there and then he went on. But only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. So again, what happens after he meets with Peter and James? He returns to the city of his birth, okay? Cilicia is where Tarsus is. Remember what Saul of Tarsus? That was where he was born. Tarsus was the leading city of Cilicia. Why did Paul go there? Well, undoubtedly, he went there to do what, what every true believer will eventually want to do, especially if you've left your family, is to go to your family and try to convince them and try to convince your friends and try to convince everybody you know as well as the whole city and all the surrounding cities. Now, that's something Paul would do, and uh, most people wouldn't, but he did. That Jesus, to convince them that Jesus is the Christ and that there's salvation only in him. Now, again, what I'm trying to do is just put together all the pieces of Paul's travels, and that can be very difficult to do. But Paul is now in Tarsus in Cilicia. Now, he's converted in Acts chapter 9. We, we read that this is what takes place, but... But what happens from there is Peter has his encounter with Cornelius and his household, and then he stands before the Jerusalem uh, apostles to give an account of why he went to the Gentiles. But then we pick up Paul's story again. But it, it, it happens that um, some of those who were scattered from the persecution involving Stephen made their way all the way to Antioch. And, and Antioch, as you know, is even further up there. And Cilicia might be a little bit further towards the west of where Antioch is, but it's further up north. And the gospel was preached, and a church was planted. And as you know, Antioch is the place where the first missionary journey began, but Paul's not there yet, right? Well, we read in Acts 11 that after that church was established, that the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to minister to them. And then we read in Acts 11, verses 23 through 26, then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord, and notice this, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. I mean, he already knew who, who, he knew who Saul was because he was the one that introduced him to the apostles, remember. But now he's in Antioch, uh, and he thinks, well, who can help with this work here? Well, Paul can help. So... He left for Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians 
in Antioch. Now again, the Lord's plan for Paul kept him out of Judea. To this point, the churches still were not familiar with him. They had never seen him, but they heard of what he was doing, and they glorified God. Now again, Paul's point is, I didn't receive this gospel from Jerusalem and from the apostles there. I received it from Christ and so forth. So these in Judea had not really contributed to him at all, and yet they were glorifying God for what was being done through him. By the way, I think we should just note here that we should always be thankful when we hear that God is using people to advance the kingdom of heaven. Shouldn't get jealous of them. Shouldn't, we should envy them in a good way. But thank God that he's raising up people to do this. But again, Paul's point is, my gospel I received, he says, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the proof that he's given up to this point is his timeline. This is where I was for how long? And I, I never spent enough time there to, to be discipled by, by the apostles. Three years, okay? Several more years before he would see them again. And his oath. But Paul has one, one more point in our text, one more piece of evidence, and that is the radical change in his life when he encountered Christ. Now, again, let's not miss the point of how he opens and how he closes the section. So he begins with this in verses 13 and 14, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure, and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. This is Paul before Christ finds him. More zealous for God than the Jews. More zealous for the traditions than the Judaizers. But when God, who had set him apart from his mother's womb, Okay, here's, here's a great you know, piece of information that we could build a whole sermon on you know, because of God's foreloving him, because of God's choosing him in Christ before the foundation of the world. You know, um, when God called Paul to faith on that road to Damascus that he might preach the gospel to the Gentiles because that was the particular work he had for Paul, his life was changed radically. We read in the closing verses, again, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. Can you imagine what the Jews must have thought about Paul? He was their champion. I mean, he was trying to stamp out the Christianity they hated, and then Paul becomes the champion of Christianity. What a radical change that took place in his life, and Paul is pointing to this now as the evidence, you know, that he points to the Galatians. How could they know that his testimony was true? Well, again, from the timeline, from the oath, but also through this, the power of a changed life. He was no longer trying to destroy the church. Now he was working to build it up. They were no longer terrified of him. Now they were glorifying God because of him. Now this Paul was presenting to them as the evidence that his gospel was true. It has the power to change lives. <laughs> the other one doesn't. It leaves you in your sins. Do you realize that, that Martin Luther held to the gospel of the Judaizers when he was unconverted and, and that Rome does, essentially. But it may not be the same set of works. It's not that Luther believed he needed to be circumcised, but he did look at baptism and he looked at everything God calls him to do as the things he must do in order for God to justify him. So it is it's the, same, the same gospel, but when he... He understands the gospel of God's free grace. It transforms his life, okay? And that is powerful evidence. As a matter of fact, Jonathan Edwards believed it was the most powerful evidence to the truth of the gospel. And it was also the greatest evidence that we as Christians can present to the world for the truth of the gospel. So let me, let me read 
a quote in closing from John Gerstner in his book, actually three volumes, called The Rational Biblical Theology of, of Edwards. And he also covers this in the tape series he does on the, uh, the same subject. But in this is a quote from John Gerstner, and then embedded in it are also quotes from Edwards, and I think it, it says it as well as it, it, as it can be said. So, quote, good works not only have the qualities spoken of above, and, and that is what he's just said, doing all that the Lord commands. You know, Christians don't just do some things and leave others undone, but because they love the Lord, they want to love him in every way. And it not only seeks to be perfect, to be perfected in that love, not satisfied with just some service, some obedience, but, you know, wants to be wholly the Lord. So good works not only have the quality spoken of above, they are also very convincing demonstrations of the reality of Christians' experience. When Satan sees them, he knows that he has been defeated and that one of his former captives is his no more. It's not mere profession that convinces Satan, but <clears throat> practical holiness alone. Such actual holiness is convincing to men as well as devils. Quote, and this is from Jonathan Edwards, a manifestation of godliness in a man's life and walk is a better ground of others' charity concerning his godliness than any account that he gives about it in words, close quote. It runs as a refrain through Edward's preaching that actions speak louder than words. Indeed, in his most famous treatise on the subject, religious, religious affections, with respect to others and to oneself, the greatest test of religious experience is clearly this one. Quote, in the sermon on, on Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24, Edwards compares the witness of a godly life with the power of preaching. And this is what Edwards writes. If those who call themselves Christians thus walked in all the paths of virtue and holiness, it would tend more to the advancement of the kingdom of Christ in the world, the conviction of sinners, and propagation of religion among unbelievers, than all the sermons in the world. So I hope you see what Edwards is saying here, and this is where the whole quote closes. If those who profess the true Christian faith actually lived as Christ calls us to live, that, he says, would advance the kingdom of heaven more than all the sermons could possibly be preached. It's not what we profess, but what we do that convinces people that the gospel is true. And that's what Paul's pointing to in his own life. God uses the gospel of his free grace to change lives. Paul's life was radically changed by the gospel that he was preaching, that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, he is saying his gospel is the true gospel. Now, Paul is later going to bring this point home to the Galatian believers when he says, how did you receive the Spirit? Was it through the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, it was by hearing with faith. It was by the free grace of God alone. And so they needed to abandon the gospel of works and embrace, of course, the gospel of free grace. We need to make sure that we don't abandon the gospel by which we're saved, the gospel that is purely God's work of salvation in our lives from beginning to end and in any way embrace works as the grounds, as the reason why God loves us and accepts us. God has loved us with an everlasting love. <laughs> he chose us in eternity. And we know in time he sent Christ. And, and of course, in his time for us, he sent his spirit to change our hearts. And that change of heart is what produces that radical change that we see in the Apostle Paul, right? God did that by himself. One of the things emphasized at the uh, conference, again, they used some highfalutin mumbo-jumbo, if I can put it that, that way, and they, they were kind of you know, teasing with that uh, kind of language. But you've heard the word monergism. You know, it just means that there's one who is working, right? Uh, 
And that is God who is working all the way up to our justification. You know, when he, when he regenerates us, he makes us alive. We didn't do anything to bring that about. It wasn't exercising my goodness and, and the ability that I have left over from the fall. I was dead. God made me alive. I trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone. At that moment, I was justified. But at that moment, your life is radically changed when he makes you alive. When you were dead before, you should not be what you were before. You should be a new creature. And that new creature is one who loves God. And that love is shown through its obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, again, Paul's going to develop that in his letter. But that is his evidence for the truth of his gospel. He received it from Christ, and it transforms lives. Well, let's, uh, let's take a moment and bow in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us search our own hearts. Because we know that to come to the table, we really do need to have transformed lives. We need to be trusting in Christ. The table of the Lord is for the Lord's people. So let's, again, if, uh, examine our lives, thank the Lord for the changes he has made, and, and repent of the sins we're, we're perhaps allowing or have committed that are contrary to that and renew our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ.